we here at the Quarterback Club are, are thrilled to have uh, uh, to have you here with us uh, in a little different way. Uh, many of you know Chris Doring from uh, how he torched us when he was a Florida Gator, and we won't hold that totally against him. Uh, but I think he led the league or the country in touchdown receptions for a long time. Had a really great career in the NFL. Uh, and uh, for the last several years has worked for ESPN uh, uh, and primarily on the SEC network and I believe is the uh, best college football analyst there is, even if he is a Florida Gator. Let's give a really nice quarterback club welcome to Chris Doyle. Chris? Thank you very much, Jeff. I appreciate you guys having me back. And I, I tell you, I'm very disappointed about not being able to be there in person with you guys. Uh, you've become one of my favorite groups to have a chance to talk to uh, because of the passion for your team, but more so uh, the football IQ, I think, that that room has in general. Uh, it, it really is a shame that I, I can't be there, but I'm looking forward to uh, having an opportunity to be back in person soon. And I guarantee you, Jeff, this is the first time that I think you probably had two Gainesville, Florida born boys on your, uh, uh, as, as guests today, coach Brumbaugh born in Gainesville, played at Keystone Heights, one of my uh, rivals in high school. And then obviously playing at Auburn and, and uh, a rival there when I was playing at Florida. So kind of uh, fun to get a chance to, to watch his success and, and listen to him talk about his defensive line and, and the overall uh, team there in Knoxville. And, and they have a lot to be proud of. I, I tell you, uh, we all talked about how, this Georgia game was going to be a litmus test for how far Coach Pruitt's uh, squad has progressed over the last couple of years. I thought defensively they went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Georgia uh, for much of the, the afternoon. Um, you look at that, that, that fourth down stop, uh, short yarded situation in the middle of the field. Uh, they got great pressure up front and, and good push and, and, and stopped uh, the quarterback sneak. Down at the goal line, uh, great goal line stand right before halftime. And even after some of the turnovers, you know, that defense got thrown into sudden change situations where uh, the defense was able to force field goals. That, that's the, one of the biggest things that, that uh, defenses are asked to do is when the offense makes a mistake in their territory, keep them out of the end zone. If you can force field goals instead of touchdowns, uh, those are wins. And I thought the defense did a great job. Now, conversely, uh, it was not the effort that I think uh, we all hope from the offensive line. I was one that thought that this uh, Tennessee offensive line was one of the best in not only the conference, but in the country when, when Kade Mays was uh, made eligible. Uh, but that, that to me, uh, the protection up front was one of the biggest issues. Uh, I think we all know, as I went back and watched the tape yesterday, um, seeing not only guys getting beaten, but blowing uh, protections in terms of what their assignments were. That, that was the thing that was most frustrating to me, not knowing who to block. Uh, I think it's, it's when you're playing against a team as talented as Georgia's front seven is, you're going to get beaten. Uh, but not knowing who to block, having guys come free is the thing that was most frustrating. And, and I know a lot of blame went to Garantano in, in terms of his ball per, uh, protection and security of the, the football. Uh, but he, he was harassed much of the afternoon. And uh, I didn't see a whole lot of help in the running game. Obviously, minus, minus one yard rushing makes it difficult and, and, and very one-dimensional when you're trying to throw the football. Even the, the, the plays down the field, you know, Palmer's two great catches were contested. Uh, I didn't see a whole lot of guys being able to separate in the secondary. So uh, I think we, we see where Tennessee is now. I think we feel uh, a lot of hope about where the future lies for this program. I think Coach Pruitt's done a tremendous job of not only recruiting, we've, we've celebrated some of the recruiting classes the last couple of years, but to me, it's the development of the, the roster that he inherited. Um, how many times do we see guys come in inherit a roster and a lot of those guys leave. Well, there has not been that. In fact, it's a, a, a lot of buy-in for the guys that were already on the roster. And that's a, a credit to, to Coach Pruitt. It's a credit to his assistant coaches for being able to communicate with, with the existing players and get them to believe in what they're trying to accomplish. So uh, I, I thought it was going to be uh, an instance this season where it was uh, between Kentucky and Tennessee that had a chance to be uh, that next team in the East to, to maybe elevate where Kentucky, uh, Florida and, and, and Georgia were. Um, and I, right now, I mean, it, it's amazing to think about this game being played so early in the season as it's uh, one that we're used to seeing in November. Um, I think overall right now what you're seeing in the league is we talked about this morning on our, our television show on the SEC Network, uh, the death of, of defense in our conference. And, um, you know, I know Coach Saban has talked an awful lot 
about how difficult it is to play defense with the rules skewed towards benefiting the offense now. Uh, the RPOs with uh, offensive linemen being allowed downfield in some instances. The pace with which uh, teams are playing offense right now. You saw uh, Ole Miss on, on Saturday night. They were running plays when the play clock was at 30 and 31 seconds. Just amazing to see how quickly they were able to get to the line of scrimmage and get their next play playoff. Uh, Alabama multiple times was caught out of position because they couldn't get lined up properly. So um, I, I think you're seeing – uh, kind of what's going to continue to be the recipe for success in this offense that's or in, in the conference, and that's uh, that's playing quickly, and that's using all 53 and a third of the yards uh, from sideline to sideline. I think that's what uh, – I go back and look at what Ole Miss did really well. Uh, Missouri did that well against LSU on Saturday. It was play design and play calling, forcing LSU to play sideline to sideline. And, um, you know, I think you're going to continue to see a big gap between where the offenses are and where defenses are. And uh, Georgia really being the, the one lone example of, of uh, a team that's playing good defense uh, to this point in time. Um, you know, I, I do think I had it, talked about heading into the season how uh, challenging I thought it was going to be for anybody to go undefeated. And here we are after three weeks of the season, only two teams undefeated. And then one uh, after next week, there will be one team that's left standing. Um, so I think it just speaks to the, the competitive nature of our conference how difficult it is to, uh, to go through an eight-game conference schedule, let alone a 10-game conference schedule. So I think what you're going to see is, is uh, those teams that have a little more depth that can roll a lot of people in, much like you saw from Georgia. Georgia's defense, I think, was able to play a bunch of different players that allowed them to stay more fresh in the second half and ultimately pull away from, from Tennessee. So those teams that are a little more mature uh, and, and have the veteran, uh, the depth, to be able to, to play a lot of teams are going to be able to survive uh, in this very unique SEC only set, uh, season. Um, you know, as I look at things that uh, I've been most impressed with, how about the new coaches coming in? Four new SEC coaches to our conference this season. And after three weeks of the year, all, all four of them have wins. Uh, and Sam Pittman should have had two wins. I mean, if we go back and look at the end of that Auburn game, uh, there's got to be a better way to, to uh, solve review issues. And I think the thing that I have the biggest problem with is the subjectivity of the rule, the immediate recovery. Um, Arkansas players, multiple Arkansas players, several Auburn players trying to get the football after Bo Nix had, had spiked the football backwards. Um, and the play, I know the whistle was being blown. I know the, uh, the officials were, were waving it off but there were still people playing after the football. And it took me back to last year when South Carolina and Missouri played. South Carolina's quarterback, Kalinske, threw a pass that was forward, got batted back to him. He caught it and then realized what he did. So tried to spike the football uh, at that point, becoming a lateral and a fumble where a lot of the players on the field stopped. There was one Missouri player specifically that kept playing. And uh, he actually got on the football after everybody else completed the play and they ruled it a touchdown. So the subjectivity of that phrase, immediate and clear uh, recovery, is what I had a problem with. And, and uh, I think we can all agree it may not show it in the record book, but uh, I think that Arkansas won that football game on Saturday. So uh, just some, some brief overall thoughts of, of where we are in the conference uh, at this point in time. Uh, Jeff, I'd love to address anything specifically that you or, or anybody else has uh, there in, in person. Yeah, Chris, we'll, we'll, we got some questions. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, let me ask you uh, two or three, Chris. Uh, one, what player uh, has stood out that you hadn't heard of uh, in our whole league that you've seen? And uh, uh, what coach uh, has achieved more than what you expected uh, in this short season so far? Yeah, so let me address, you know, I've been impressed with where DeAndre Johnson came out of. If we're talking Tennessee first, uh, I know that he had a disappointing penalty in the Georgia game that uh, eliminated him from that contest. Uh, but to have three and a half sacks in the first two ball games um, after not doing an awful lot in his previous years in Knoxville, I think is pretty impressive. But that, that speaks to something that I experienced uh, as a player in college um, with guys that were around me that didn't realize – you know, how quickly things go by. And I can tell you my own experience as a player. Uh, we would have older guys that would come back to campus and, and talk about, hey, make sure you guys enjoy it. Take advantage of the opportunity because it goes like that. Um, I think sometimes it takes guys longer for the light to come on for them. 
Um, and, and it seemed like DeAndre Johnson realized there was a greater sense of urgency this year with, with time running out on his college career. Now, in terms of where I, it's funny you guys mentioned this because I have a list of guys that have basically come out of nowhere. Um, we're going to do a segment on this on the uh, SEC Network or SEC Now on Friday night uh, in regards to, to, to breakout players. Uh, Traylon Smith is a guy that you saw for Arkansas. Um, have a big game against Auburn, the running back number 22. Uh, hadn't heard much about him prior to this season. Kyrus Jackson is a, a player for Georgia that you guys probably saw way too much of on Saturday, becoming a solid number two option in Georgia's passing game. Uh, number 10, I think he had four catches for almost 100 yards against you guys. Uh, Caleb Chapman is a guy that I saw too much of as a Florida guy. Uh, Texas A&M receiver absolutely torched Florida secondary. Um, you know, it, it kind of, I guess I have a soft spot in my heart, skinny, tall, white dude playing wide receiver. So I was uh, happy to get a chance to watch him have a lot of success. Now I know he tweaked his knee. I'm hoping that he's okay, able to come back. Um, Kevin Harris, a running back for, uh, for South Carolina, went up for about 175 yards in that victory over Vanderbilt. Hadn't heard much of him. And then finally, uh, Connor Bazelak. Connor Bazelak is a, uh, a great story as well. Richard freshman at, at Missouri took over the uh, starting quarterback job after coming in last week against you guys. And uh, I thought he had a tremendous game against LSU. Um, really the, the entire offense did a great job of, of creating uh, some balance, running the football, throwing the football and uh, LSU. I mean, they just look like a mess in the secondary right now. So he was able to take advantage of those guys. Was there, a second, there was a second part of that question too, Jeff. What was the second part? Yeah, thanks. We got one in the back. I'll get to my, my question isn't as important as these guys' questions. <laughs> the question is, does Coach Spurrier ever text you uh, during your shows, uh, Chris? On yeah, 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 so he, he doesn't text me, but when I talk to him, he goes, ah, hey, make sure you tell Coach Chizik, let you talk some. He talks too much. So he, uh, he always is fighting for my right <laughs> get him a little bit more edgewise, but uh, it, it's funny because uh, I'm a 47-year-old I'm a man. I think I've told you guys before, uh, Coach Spurrier, you know, as soon as he gets on me for something, it takes me right back to being 18, 19 years old again. And I actually got a, I got a phone call from him uh, this summer. It was a Sunday. I'm laying in the bed studying, uh, reading up on Auburn. I was doing an Auburn preview. And uh, my phone rings. I see Coach Spurrier's name. And I pick it up, and Coach gets in. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Yeah, me and Bobby Stoops, we just drove down to Crescent Beach. We went, went fishing out with John Exonitis, one of your former teammates. You like fishing, Chris? I was like, yeah, I like fishing. It's okay. It's a good time. He goes, yeah, we caught a bunch of fish. Like, at this point, I, I thought he was going to invite me to a fish fry. And then it turned into, yeah, on the way down, I heard something you said on the radio. He got all over me. So I'm, I'm a 47-year-old man getting lectured by my, my college coach about uh, things I'm saying on the radio. And it, uh, it took me right back to being in college again. So I'm, I have the utmost respect and love for Coach Berger. And uh, I'm still intimidated about uh, any interaction I have with him at 47 years of age. One of the ladies here wants to know, was he right? Uh, he was right. He was right. He's always right. I, I, I always defer to Coach Spurrier. And, and the funny thing about Coach is, is – uh, and even – you know, as, as players, his perception is reality. So it could be completely different from the way that, that I perceive things, but uh, whatever his perception is, is the truth. And uh, I, I'm still uh, remembering that as a, as a grown up with kids of my own. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, question. It seems to be very exciting. I mean, it's an uh, SEC game. Uh, James Kidman, so James Kidman, James Kidman, a good question as well. The question is, is uh, the fans seem to love the 10 games in the SEC. Do you think it will go to nine uh, in the future? Or yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I think we all have enjoyed the 10-game SEC schedule. Um, I think what you're seeing already, and you're going to see more of it as the season wears on, is the toll that it takes. I mean, I can tell you as a player that played in eight um, – by the end of the year, you're, you're physically worn out, you're emotionally worn out, you're drained. Um, 
I, I, I think you're going to see a lot of uh, injuries as the season wears on. Um, you know, Commissioner Sankey's talked about the idea you can't do nine because of the, the way it works out with the odd scheduling. So it would either have to be eight or ten. Um, and, and I think you're, you're seeing what happens when you play a ten-game schedule against SEC teams is that you're knocking one another off. There's cannibalism. And the equation for winning or getting to college football playoff uh, berths and, and winning national championships is, is uh, it's, it's more conducive to accomplishing that with an eight-game schedule. Now, I don't know how us as fans, how we can go back to watching group of five opponents and FCS opponents. Like, that just doesn't seem appealing to me right now. And in a time where I imagine they're going to want to try to get people's butts back in seats I, I just have a hard time believing that they're going to create much interest in that. Um, every single week, it has been exciting to tune in and get a chance to watch uh, what we're seeing within the conference. And uh, I just I, I think there's a lot that can be taken from this year that can be built on going forward. Uh, unfortunately, I just don't know that that's going to be one of the things that we see stay around next year. How do you explain LSU on defense? Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, you know, one thing we can we can point to the youth. You know, they lost a lot in that secondary. And week one against Mississippi State, having Stingley out hurt them from a production standpoint, from a leadership standpoint. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, Bo Pelini needed to make an adjustment at halftime of that game. I mean, getting out of playing so much man coverage, we've seen the recipe for beating uh, the, this Mississippi State offense is you play soft, right? You rush three, you drop eight, you keep everything underneath. Barry Odom did a great job with that last week. And this past weekend, Kentucky did a, a phenomenal job of building on that game plan, uh, created six interceptions in that football game. How about this? Kentucky had 157 yards of total offense and won the game. Uh, it's just amazing to think about. Um, and, and even more amazing to think that Mike Leach's offense got zero points in that game. Two points scored on special teams with an errant uh, snap on the punt. But um, I, I think the blueprint is out for how you beat this air raid offense. And uh, I'm really concerned about what the future is for, uh, for that. But uh, back to your question about in terms of LSU, I think they'll be okay eventually. But the thing I think that disappointed me the most was the lack of any sort of halftime adjustments in any of the games. Um, I would say that uh, LSU looked worse in the second half uh, defensively than they did in the first. And that's saying a lot, given how bad they were in the first 30 minutes of that game. Yes, sir. You asked him in the first set four backs, you know, he's not the situation with Prince of Florida, Matt Correll on this, and Jones and Alabama. What is made in that set for Steve and Google, wide receiver? Because the Tennessee takes one of the best ones. Good question. Again. Uh, uh, Chris, the, uh, the question is, it, it, uh, the questioner says there it looks to be three really good quarterbacks in our league right now. Uh, uh, the guy that will miss Corral and uh, Mac Jones and uh, uh, who's part of Trask, Kyle Trask at Florida. Uh, uh, why are they playing so well? And who is the, uh, who would you pick if you had to win one game of those three to, uh, to play with? So I think one of the things that stands out to me are the different situations between all three of those guys. I would say Trask and Jones are a little bit more uh, alike in terms of why they've been successful uh, than what Matt Corral is. Um, for, for Jones and Trask, I think it's a comfort in the offense and the benefit from watching uh, some of the, the other guys play uh, ahead of them. I, I think the silver lining in Tua's injury last year for Alabama was that Mac Jones got a chance to play in the, in the final three or four games of the season, uh, got some experience, uh, gained some confidence for himself, but more so I think he gained the confidence of his teammates to know that not only could he run the offense, but he was going to be very effective and efficient within the offense. And I think that's the same for Kyle Trask. Just an amazing story, and I'm sure you guys all know it, but I, I just can't reiterate enough in a day and age where players – come in and they believe that they're entitled to instant gratification and playing right away, especially at the quarterback spot. I mean, how many quarterbacks do we see come in uh, and then don't win the job and, and decide to transfer elsewhere and never compete, never give themselves an opportunity to win that job down the road? Uh, this is a guy that hung in there for a long period of time. He never even started at, in high school. His last start before, you know, last year was in, in ninth grade. Uh, so he, he was used to coming off the bench. He was used to understanding his role as a backup quarterback. 
um, bided his time in Florida, didn't transfer, and got his chance last year when Felipe Franks went down. So I think he came in prepared. The offense moved effectively. Uh, he had a lot of rhythm to the offense and flow. And uh, I think he's built on that experience that he gained last year, this season. Now, the Mar Matt Corral phenomenon to me. Like this, I, mean, I don't understand. I think somebody in Russia is listening in on this. I will. Thank you. Yes, Anybody else have a question? Sorry about this, guys. I, I don't know. Yes, sir. Thank you. I will. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Actually, think he's at home, but uh, well, I don't know. I mean, he's, in he's in Charlotte. Yeah, he's in Charlotte. He texted me and he said he's telling me it's waiting. Jeff, you got me again here? I got you, man. And, uh, listen, there's there's a boatload of questions. That's what happens when you drop it, man. You're going to get to answer a bunch of questions. Here's number one. Uh, 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 what kind of, since uh, 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 that sorry Lane Kiffin is uh, uh, not around to get uh, chewed out, who do you think got the biggest uh, chewing uh, on the Alabama staff? That's question one. Question number two. Uh, that sorry, Kip, and what, what do you think his ceiling is? Yeah, so first of all, I think uh, Pete Golding probably got the, uh, the biggest chewing out. I mean, when your defense gives up an all-time record for uh, yards allowed in a game, uh, I don't imagine that Coach Saban was very happy with, with that. Um, you know, in terms of the ceiling, I think it's going to come down to their defense. And, um, you know, their, their, their offense certainly is very capable. Uh, they put up a, a bunch of points in their first three ball games, but if you go in and look statistically, they're at the bottom of every single defensive statistic in the SEC. Uh, so I think their ceiling is going to be dependent on their ability to recruit and develop defensive players, something that the, uh, the previous staff didn't put an awful lot of emphasis on. Another question is, is how high do you think Ohio State can go in the polls without playing a game? <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? I, I don't understand the thinking in that, uh, including them. You know, I, I, once, once they play a game, I certainly believe it's okay for, for them to be included. But 
I don't understand why we would possibly allow them to, uh, or anybody else from the Big Ten or the Pac-12 at this point in time to be in the polls when we've got a large sample size of everybody else and nothing to, uh, to grade Ohio State or, or any of those other teams on. Yeah, the, the question is, Matt Corral, what makes him different? And uh, which, which uh, I know uh, Dr. Stadium is effective. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know how much you heard. I was trying to talk about him earlier, and I know I got cut off. But I, I think um, me, the thing yeah. that I've been most impressed with about Matt Corral is, uh, is how athletic he is. You know, I mean, uh, we, we thought last year that Corral was the passing quarterback, and, and it was John Rice Plumley that was the running quarterback. But I think the dual threat nature from what I've seen from, from uh, Corral so far has been really impressive because they use him – in the quarterback run game, they use him in the RPO stuff, uh, puts a lot of pressure on defense. In fact, you know, maybe one of his biggest skills is his scrambling ability, uh, neutralizing any opponent's ability to rush the quarterback. Like, I don't, it, maybe it's just the number, wearing number two, but he reminds me an awful lot of, of, uh, of Johnny Manziel running around uh, like in the backyard making plays. Uh, I think the other thing he reminds me of, he, he drops that ball down sidearm an awful lot, so he's got a little Patrick Mahomes in him as well. But I, I, I don't think he's getting the credit that he deserves right now nationally, uh, maybe being overshadowed a little bit by Mac Jones and Kyle Trask's success. Somebody just texted a question. I don't know if you were able to uh, – uh, I'm sure you watched it on film. Physically, up front, did we look like we mirrored just in the uniform Georgia on both sides of the line of scrimmage? I know we didn't play as well as they did, but physically – do we look the same? Yeah, I, I think physically, you know, from what I could tell on the uh, on the TV copy and on the coaches' copy that I watched, I thought physically they they looked up to the task. And and what a what a you know an amazing transformation on the offensive line from where Tennessee was just two years ago to where they are now with uh, what's the stat like four uh, five star offensive linemen up front. Um, it just really impressed with what uh, Jeremy Pruitt's been able to do through recruiting and, and getting, obviously, a big transfer in Cade Mays. Uh, I, I think the thing we haven't talked about enough, and I go back to what I mentioned earlier, was how, how that matchup of, of the Vols' uh, defensive front went, particularly in the first half against uh, Georgia's offensive line. Uh, Georgia, got, Georgia manhandled Auburn up front last week, and uh, they did not have their way in the same uh, uh, kind of manner that they did against Auburn. Uh, against you guys on Saturday. So I think there's a lot of things to uh, to be positive about. I know that in the SEC, we don't, especially, you know, teams at the top like Tennessee, we don't we don't uh, accept moral victories, but I think there's a lot of positive that could be taken out of that game on Saturday. Yes, sir. About a, a uh, analysis and prediction of the SEC championship. Good question. Uh, the... Uh, the, the question is uh, an analysis of the Georgia-Alabama uh, uh, game and a prediction on your end, please. Yeah, man, I, I'm back and forth on this one, and uh, we were discussing it this morning on our show. Uh, I really believe that, uh, that Georgia's defense, I mean, just the, how, how well they've been built, it's going to be an incredible test for, for Alabama. Um, you know, Alabama, their offensive line – looked a little uh, shaky at times. I know they ran the football really well, but I think that's an undersized, under-talented uh, defensive front for Ole Miss. Um, I, I'm the, 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 the matchup I think I'm most excited about is that really talented group of wide receivers. I, I love Alabama's wide receivers going up against Georgia's secondary, who, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't see a whole lot of uh, open receivers on Saturday when you guys played them. Uh, they play a lot of press coverage. They're going to challenge Alabama's receivers. And uh, I think that's going to be where the game's won or lost is, is Georgia's ability to cover those guys on the outside. Yes, sir. The question is, is the Texas A&M offense that good and improved that much from the week before or the issue of the Florida defense? Uh, Florida's defense is terrible, and uh, I think it, 
it really all – it all stems from the, the defensive line. I mean, Florida's been really fortunate over the last couple of years to, uh, to have a very talented, very physically uh, gifted defensive line where they're able to get a lot of penetration. They are disruptive in the run game. Uh, they can get after the quarterback without having to blitz. And right now, Florida's defensive line, they, 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 can't, they can't get any push up front. They can't penetrate. They can't set the edge. Uh, they can't rush the quarterback. They can't tackle. Other than that, they're good. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real problem uh, for Florida. And uh, they've had to try to compensate by blitzing a little bit more. Um, I, I watched Texas A&M's line do a great job of picking up the blitzes and the, the stunts. Uh, Kellen Mond did a great job of getting the football out. And uh, 13 of 16 is just a ridiculous third down conversion percentage. Um, so Florida has a lot of problems. Even the secondary, like, this was supposed to be a strength of that team. Uh, Marco Wilson's played a lot of snaps in this, this conference. Uh, Kair Elam was one of the best freshmen last year. Um, so you're looking at a secondary and, and Sean Davis is back. Like these guys are underperforming right now. And I think it all stems to the lack of, of uh, talent and experience on the defensive line. Well, uh, here's, here's uh, one of the last questions and we'll, we'll, we'll stop you at one as, promise uh, uh, Chris what happens uh, uh, when uh, uh, Alabama beats Georgia and Alabama unfortunately probably beats Tennessee but Tennessee beats Florida and everybody ends up with uh, in the east with eight wins and two losses who gets the championship then? Well, first of all that would make me look really yeah. smart because I predicted in the preseason the SEC champion would have two losses so uh, I'm okay with that happening um, I do think that uh, it is going to be interesting, too. I think it would be important for us to note, as a Florida guy, all I ever heard was, uh, man, if we played you guys at the end of the year instead of uh, in September, we'd beat you. And, of course, uh, 2001, when that actually happened, you guys came to the swamp and, and knocked the Gators off and, and knocked Florida out of the, uh, the national championship hunt that year. So I think I'm nervous about that game as a Florida guy. Coming up to Knoxville in December, that is uh, – us Florida boys don't like the cold weather. So, I, I'm not so sure how that uh, stands for us there. But, yeah, you're right. I think uh, it's going to be difficult to decide who gets in. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see two teams from the SEC get in this season. But I think it's very likely um, that you're going to see uh, an instance where teams are just cannibalizing one another as the season plays out. Yeah, uh, well, you need to know that uh, one of our oldest and, and, and uh, uh, most respected members is a meteorologist, and he predicts that on December the 5th, there's six inches of snow, and it's nine degrees. And he's he's hey. pretty funny on that, too. Hey, I, 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 I promise you, if that's the case, uh, give me Tennessee by double digits, because uh, I don't think we navigate that well. Hey, Chris, great to, uh, great to have you. Uh, we'll talk soon, and uh, thanks a lot. You did a great job for us. Let's give a nice quarterback club welcome to everybody. Thank you, guys.